Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us again on Celebrating Act 2. As you can see, we're with our favorite uh, brain whisperer, Stephen Campbell. Stephen, good Hello. to see you again. Oh, good to see you again, John. Have you been well? You staying safe? I have, despite the fact that we've been going through a year uh, of turmoil. What a year! Yeah. Well, maybe you what could actually help. Maybe you could help us out because uh, um, I'm I'm I believe that I'm a guy who believes that the glass is always full, even if it's got only half water, it's got half air. We need air mm -hmm. too, and mm -hmm. I tend to look at almost everything in those terms of what's all the good stuff, and sort of you know, the bad stuff we'll deal with. Okay, but there's enough good stuff that that's what I concentrate on and, and sort of block out or, or push out the bad stuff. But I know a lot mm -hmm. of people have trouble uh, doing mm -hmm. that. Do you have any advice about how people well, can become more optimistic? As a teacher, my modus operandi is to make it simple to learn. So I, I really narrow it down to how you can learn to be optimistic. The book that I use oftentimes is called Learned Optimism by Dr. E.T. Seligman out of the University of Pennsylvania. He has a wonderful website on positive psychology. He's kind of the expert on the whole Learned Optimism book. And if you want to look into the details of it, I highly recommend that you buy it. What he has been doing for the last 40 years is studying optimistic people and looking at how they think. And he started, however, with looking at pessimists. So let's sort of look at both ways. We have pessimists and we have optimists. Here's, here's how pessimists work. Their philosophy is, ready? Life happens to me. So I had no um, way of choosing where I was born, how I was raised, what I look like, what I've done, where I failed, where I've succeeded. Um, what I think, it's just the way I was raised. There's not much I can do about it. I just, I just have to be mature and accept it. I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to live in kind of a dream world. I'm dealing with reality, and I have had especially to do this during the pandemic. So um, this is the way it is. Okay, that's a pessimistic perspective. That's a closed box. We're stuck. There's nothing we can do about it. We can change it a little bit, but it's really hard. Okay, optimists are different. They think differently. They say, if you want to narrow it down to one sentence, I always can choose what I think. I'll say that again. Optimists say to themselves, I always have a choice. I can think this way or I can think that way. And that's the basis of cognitive psychology. So as a teacher, let me give you an example of how optimists and pessimists work. About 10 years ago, I was teaching at a university and I was also the evening dean. So I would teach during the day, take myself out to dinner, come back and, run, and do the evening school. One day when I was leaving to take myself out to dinner, the receptionist called me and said, your wife's on the phone, your wife's on the phone, your wife's on the phone. And I picked up the phone. And if you've ever known Mary, you know that she talks. I mean, she talks. And you get here near a phone, she talks even more. However, have you ever picked up the phone? You know something's wrong. You just know it. And as I picked up the receptionist's phone and I listened, Mary was quiet. And Mary's not quiet when she's talking on the phone. And finally, I had to say, hi. What's going on? Silence. And then in a very quiet voice, I heard, I have cancer. And I need everybody home, daughters, husbands, etc. So we all went home. Mary had breast cancer. It would mean being out of work for six months to a year, mastectomy, radiation, um, chemotherapy, which means she would be sick to her stomach from the radiation. 
she could lose a lot of hair from the chemotherapy and everything was all tilted over and so we talked about it our daughters and us and we drank and ate laughed cried all the plethora of feelings that come when you're dealing with cancer then the girls went home and mary and i talked into the night and i had two books that i rely on one is the bible and one is learned optimism and I knew learned optimism backwards and forwards. So we sat down and we made some agreements. We said, okay, here's the cancer with the radiation and the chemotherapy and all the things that go with cancer. And it's going to be really hard. Absolutely. You're right. You're right. You're right. But it's not the only thing in our lives. So here's the first thing that optimist does when dealing with really 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 hard stuff they isolate it they isolate it i s o l a t e we isolated the cancer we said yes we're not going to die it's not there it is but it's not the only thing in our lives we have other things in our life that are just as real and just as exciting like we live in sonoma county like our daughters are married to men who love them even more than we do, which I never thought would be possible. And so we decided that we were going to isolate this cancer and not let it be an umbrella over the rest of our lives. Was that a one time decision? Of course not. When things got rough, we had to make that decision many, many times. But here's the most exciting part about this, John and Art. Once we decided it, our brain rewired itself. So that decision became easier and easier and easier to make because that's how the brain works. It becomes your friend. So the first thing that an optimist does is isolate it. The second thing was something really, really challenging happens is they temporalize it. What does that mean? They say life is a moving picture. Life is always changing. I can guarantee you that tomorrow is going to be different from today. And you already know that. And an optimist locks onto that and says, okay, Mary has cancer today, but one year from now, she's not going to have cancer. How do you know? We don't know. But that's an affirmation. That's we're locking on to. Mary will be cancer free one year from today. Let's not wait for a year to rejoice. Let's rejoice right now. Wow, that's exciting because we now live in a time in man's history where cancer can be dealt with and can be cured. Hmm. 50 years ago, that wasn't the point. Now we do. That's what we locked on to. Number three. So number one, we isolate it. Number two, it's temporalized. We say life is going to change and, and the year from now, Mary's going to be cancer free. Do we know that? Of course, we didn't know that. But that's what we locked on to. Number three, we said to ourselves, going back to what I've talked about before, I always can choose what I'm thinking. So I can choose to look cancer and just get completely freaked out. Or I can choose to look at cancer and say, yes, it's hard, but it's a bump in the road and we'll get through this. Because we've been through worse, which we have. And what did our brain say? Oh, okay. And the wonderful thing about the brain, the brain doesn't care whether what you're saying is true or not. Never even ask that question. All it cares about is what you tell it. And a year later, Mary was cancer free. And the year after that, the year after that, the year after that, and then a year after that, she called me on the phone, same time in the same way, reception said, your wife's on the phone, but this time it was different. I picked up the phone and Mary immediately said, hi, hi, why'd you call? I just walked out of the doctor's office. They found something. <gasps> How are you doing? You know what, Steve? I'm doing all right. How? I made it through last time. I can make it through this time. What changed? Not the cancer. 
It's what Mary said about the cancer. It's what we chose to say about the cancer. Steve, what about your feelings? What do you do with your feelings? Here's, I think, the most exciting discovery that psychologists made in the last 60 years. And the book that you want to read, if you want to look into this, is The Guide to Rational Living by Dr. Albert Ellis and Robert uh, Sherman. Here's what they discovered. Our feelings primarily, not completely, but primarily come from our beliefs. You hear me? Our feelings about the cancer were not coming from the cancer. They were coming from our beliefs about the cancer. People say, well, I'm not really sure what I believe. There's a wonderful handle on that. Look at your self-talk. Look at what you're saying. So our feelings about the cancer came from Mary and I agreeing that, yes, it's going to be challenging, but it's going to be over in a year because that's what the doctor said. We just didn't make it up. The doctor said, probably in a year, you'll be cancer free. So let's go back and review all of this and put it together. Can we become optimistic? Absolutely. Can we learn to become optimistic? Absolutely. How do we do that? By looking at our self-talk when hard stuff happens. And when hard stuff happens, optimists do three things. They isolate it. And they say it isn't the only thing in our life. They temporalize it. They say it will not always be this way. And number three, I have a choice to choose what I'm thinking and choose what I'm saying and choose what I'm believing. And since our beliefs come before our feelings, those will in turn affect what we're feeling. And the wonderful thing about all of this is that your brain's listening, it believes you, and then it's rewiring itself so that the decisions that you make become easier and easier and easier to make. So once we decided we're not gonna let this be an umbrella, it became easier and easier and easier for us to agree to that. And our brain said, what? Oh, okay. Is it true? I don't even care. Wow. Well, I was right. So this, this is great, great insight. However, it's really, really difficult if you are not like art yeah. and you are predisposed to see all the problems uh, of an issue. Oh, this and this and that and the other. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be cancer. It can just be, no. you know, a day at work. Absolutely. Right? A day at work. Absolutely. I've got to, oh, i got to do yeah. all this. And I've got, before I can do that, i got to do this and this. And oh, yeah. my God, what could go wrong? Yeah. It's really difficult to change your self-talk, isn't it? To let tell, tell you, yourself. Let me tell you something, John. What you said makes it difficult because that's what you're saying and our brain believes everything we tell it so when you say it is really difficult the brain says yeah you know what it really really is and so what i tell people is it doesn't have to be look at what you're saying to yourself pay attention to your self-talk and realize that you can choose to replace that. Notice I didn't say change. I hate the word change. The brain hates change. The brain doesn't want you to change. When, the, when you start saying, I'm going to change this, the brain just gets all uptight and scared. Oh, let's not change it. Let's go back. So I use the word replace. Let's replace what you just said, John. It's really difficult with, yes, but I'm learning to think differently. I'm learning to replace this. So when I'm aware of the negative stuff, I'm stopping myself and saying, wait a minute. That's not me anymore. I think differently. And since our brain believes what we tell it, the more we say that, the more the brain rewires itself. So the optimistic part comes. And over time, you see the glass as half full. And of course, the more you do this, the easier it will be. That's right, because the brain... Very difficult in the itself. beginning, but the more That's you right. do it, the easier it will be. That's why they call this neuroplasticity. And, and listening to yourself talk is the beginning of it. Just Pay attention to it. Listen That's to yourself. Right. That's right. What are you telling yourself? 
That's right. Well, I'm, yeah, yes. I'm, I'm but, optimistic. I'm optimistic, John, that you're going to become more optimistic. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> I don't Ray think Whisperer. so. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have some negative thoughts about that. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen but Campbell, you, this is wonderful stuff. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you so, so much for the evening. insights to how our brain works and how thank we can change me. our lives. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.